I'm lecturing acute dental care, so I deal with quite a bit of pain. And obviously, RCM has gone through some key factors, but I just want to give some maybe some some things uh, routine stuff, some things uh, alternative, because obviously a lot of people are asking, well, fine, you're telling us all this stuff, but we can't see any patients. So I'm going to try and see uh, little tips that I use. Um, and obviously at the end, it'll be uh, great to hear everyone's tips so we can all sort of collate our information. Um, right, let's move to the next slide. So I think the first thing is um, I, I look a lot at the psychological element of the patients, especially because we do a lot of sedation. Um, and, you know, we need to make the practice inviting. This is a, a pediatric uh, uh, practice in the States. And who wouldn't want to go there? Forget about kids going there. What about adults? You know, everyone's want to go there. So we need to really look at the, the scene we're in. Um, just a quick disclaimer. Some techniques I'm going to be discussing are for information purposes only. The reason I say that is because I'll be talking about stuff like intravenous lignocaine, which I have started to use more and more. Um, but obviously, maybe those in general dental practice not trained in ILS, ALS, um, with appropriate facilities and monitoring, um, you're not going to be going out and doing this um, in, in general practice or in practice at all. So just, just for information, but it's good to know the armamentarium that we do have um, to be able to assist our patients, especially in these acute cases where sometimes they're in, you just can't get them numb for whatever reason. So we need to use some other adjuncts that can assist us. Um, so there's some amazing papers out there on the top right hand side, pain by Dr. Tara Renton uh, in uh, the dental update. It's a series of papers. It's very, very good, but she talks, um, and we're going to look at this, why uh, a lot of the times blocks, uh, so inferior, inferior alveolar, they do not work. That's why a lot of times you might give an ID block, you may get lip numbness. The minute you put your drill on the tooth, the pace, patient is jumping. It's because the, the pulp is not numb. So we're going to quickly look at anesthesia, Analgesia, not going to talk about antibiotics too much, but just some, give some key tips in infective cases at the moment over the phone, triaging and uh, prescriptions. Look a bit at some sedatives, which you can also prescribe yourselves. And um, the reason I put acute, acute sinusitis is just a quick example of something that causes us a lot of problems in terms of diagnosis of pain, um, home remedies and TMJ now and post COVID, because we are going to see a severe rise in patients with TMJ dysfunction. From all the stress they're going through, losing houses, losing jobs, whatever, they're going to be a lot of patients that are going to be suffering for this. And I just want to talk a little bit of what I see as the future dental team. Um, so as I say I've talked about my clinical work. Um, the main thing that I'm trying to do at the moment is to set up a clinical psychology unit at the Royal London Dental Hospital um, with a dedicated clinical hypnotherapy, uh, CBT and NLP department, because a lot of the patients we see have life traumas. So the dentistry is not the problem. They have life traumas, and if we don't reset that patient, um, they become chronic users of a sedation service. Um, they suffer from chronic pain syndromes, and we actually do them no favors by constantly just having them referred back in and out from, from the general dental practice. I'm also going to be talking a little bit at the end about the use of propolis. Um, for those of you that know me, I'm a beekeeper, so I advocate a lot of use of honey as general systemic use for immunity, but I'm going to show you how you can use propolis even in these acute cases, soft tissue lesions where you can't see the patient or treat them. They can self treat themselves, they can treat themselves uh, very useful in uh, acute ulceration, aptus alteration, and I'll show you a couple of cases. Right, pain we know has multiple facets, neuropathic, um, trigeminal neuralgia, burning mouth syndrome, and obviously the uh, surgical impact from procedures that we do, uh, tooth extractions, um, post-operative problems, dry sockets, um, musculoskeletal. So a lot of TMJ patients that we see, the problem is starting from their lower back or the neck region. Um, and it's, it's important to try and involve an osteopath in this. Um, and again, that's what I talk about the, at the end, the future of the dental team. And again, obviously neurovascular type pains, tension, headaches, migraines, um, have a different uh, uh, neurogenic pathway. Um, so it's important to uh, just be aware of the different uh, types of pain and orofacial pain that we'll be um, triaging the patients for. Pain is obviously real, but it has a huge psychogenic element. Example, burning mouth syndrome, temporomandibular joint pain syndrome. Of course, it's to do with a lot of its sleep disturbance. So if we don't, we, what we do as dentists, we treat the symptoms. We give them a night splint, we give them some diazepam, we give them non steroid inflammatories, but we do nothing to solve the problem. And we actually therefore are not helping our patients fully. 
We are healthcare workers, therefore we look at the whole range of what we can do. With respect to my general medical practitioner colleagues, they do amazing work, they, but they're so snowed under with treating all the other diseases that you know they don't have time. Just like in, unfortunately, in general dental practice, especially for those working in the national health system, you don't have the time to do all this. So it's important to liaise with people who can assist our patients. Because if you can let that patient potentially have a good night's sleep, if they're a bruxist, they're not going to have their TMJ problem. They're not going to come to see you as a dentist. So it's that whole facet that I'm going to be talking about, this holistic approach to dental care, which unfortunately in dental schools, I won't harp on about it, but it's, it's a big gripe of mine. Dental schools, we fail to teach students about all of this. So we do ourselves a disservice. Right, so alternative approaches, um, example, acute sinusitis. Why did they get it in the first place? If we're not looking at why they've got it, it's all well and fine giving them the, the, the treatment that we advise them, but what's the reason they've got it? So we can look at that acute parasitis. You know, they're dehydrated. So how do you rehydrate the dehydrated? We're not taught anything about that. We need to look at that. Um, we have to look at the patient's systemic condition. As we always taught in dental school, look at the systemic, look at the systemic, but we're not taught how to deal with systemic. Patients are run down at the moment, you know, COVID, the winter flu. A lot of times you'll see, in a, in, if you work in just general practice, a lot of your patients in winter will come because they've got these sinus problems, but they think they have tooth problems. So how are we going to assist them, you know? And as I say, sadly, due, due to this whole uh, situation we're facing, you know, life is going to become more stressful for everyone. You know, people are going to face life traumas um, and we're going to have to be ready to treat these kind of patients who are going to be presenting in general practice in specialist care with all these TMJ problems. Um, in the past, cocaine tooth, toothache drops, we can't use that. So we look at something that um, we can legally prescribe. So anesthesia, um, local, regional, general. We're obviously going to look, focus on local, but we can use some regional blocks as well. Um, and obviously general uh, based in the hospital setting. Um, I'm not going to talk about too much about types of local anesthetic. You all do this day in, day out, so I'm not here to preach. But um, as Asim said, articane, amazing. Obviously, there's a controversy whether you can use it for blocks, but um, the high block, the Gao Gates or the Varisani um, technique is very, very useful. And I'm using that more and more now, especially in hospital where patients have had these failed uh, local anesthetic. Um, and the reason that's why they're in hospital. But even things like if we want long, long acting um, uh, uh, local anesthetic, especially for patients, we see more and more patients going for more and more complex surgery, all on four implants. Sometimes these, these cases are long. So using things like bupivacaine um, are, are very, very useful. They're not easy to get hold of some of these things in local, in, in general practice. So you may not come across it unless you work in the hospital, but um, can have a seven hour duration. Now, whether that's good or bad, there's obviously pros and cons. Um, something that a lot of hygienists use, um, I don't know much of the periodontists if they use it, but something with like a topical anesthetic, which doesn't need to be injected. Um, so it can be deposited uh, in the membrane, mucous membrane. You can use, for example, lidocaine with benzocaine or a quix is a, is a, is a uh, dispensing like a little, uh, pen type nodule. Um, again, it's very useful for surface topical analgesia, root planing. Um, now, failure of local anesthetic, this is what we're sort of concerned about um, with these acute hot pulps. Um, there's some good papers out there. Um, obviously, there's always going to be an element of the operator. Um, psychological anxiety plays a huge part to failure of local anesthetic. Um, and then obviously, there's pharm pharmaceutical reasons, anatomy, accessory innovation, and then obviously pathology. That's what we're dealing with. That's why we're treating the patient in the first place, because they've got some sort of pathology, which has led to inflammation of the pulp. This paper, I think as a dentist, if you, any clinician working in the dental field, you have to read this paper because she talks about how limited the ID block is. And I'll go through um, uh, some points that she's raised and we all see this in local practice. So you see a patient, you numb them up, you waited a couple of minutes, the lips completely numb. And as I say, the tooth is not numb. It's because the ID does not work. It doesn't work in these cases. First of all, the problem is time. So, and all these, these points I've, I've taken from her papers, haven't randomly made them up. They've, they've got evidence behind them. So lip numbness occurs um, five to 10 minutes, um, but the anesthesia, palpal anesthesia takes between 15 to 16 minutes, but we don't have that time in general practice. 
So it's a problem. Um, so usually by the time you've given the first ID block, the patient's not numb. So you think, well, okay, maybe it was me. I didn't hit the right spot. The anatomy was dodgy. You can always blame the patient, but uh, we give another block. And then the patient starts getting numb a few minutes later. It's got nothing to do with the second block we've given. It's because we've waited that time for the first block to work. So if you see, again, lip numbness doesn't guarantee palpable anesthesia. Um, we need to wait, especially in mandibular area, you know, sometimes up to 30 minutes. So even what Asim said about preoperatively give, telling your patient in these hot pulp cases to take 600 milligrams, or you can even use um, some um, endodontist advice, 347 milligrams, two tablets of ibuprofen they can take because that starts kicking in centrally. And a lot of these cases, we need to hit the central system as well as the local system. Okay, so again, Malamed, we all know about him. He's a famous um, clinician in dental anesthesia. He's written all the books on it. And he said, you know, that inadequate anesthesia occurs from 31 to 81%. That's pretty high. And we've all faced this. Um, and he noted that, ex especially in terms of the ID block. So it's because the patient's in a disease state, um, they've got pathological infection, and obviously, endodontists deal with this day in and day out, so they're going to have um, some amazing tips. But there's a lot of papers out there, apart from Tara Renton's one, in Dental Update. There's another one in the European Journal of Biomedical and Pharmaceutical Sciences, which again talks about the failure of inferior alveolar nerve block. That's why I'm going to talk about the high block, which is very, very useful um, in these pathological disease states. Okay, So we know there's ID infiltration, intraligamental, intrapulpal, intraosseous, Fine, we obviously go for these to start with. And as Asim said, we can use diagnostic LA, that's a de deposition of a small amount of local anesthesia within a defined anatomical region to see if that gets rid of, the, rid of the patient's pain, if we are having difficulty in making a pain diagnosis, which happens a lot of times in dentistry. It's not nothing new. So we can look at using a high block, akinosi block, and you can use articane for this. Um, and I say something I'm using more and more is intravenous lignocaine. This is plain lignocaine, which most practices won't have. So you cannot use lignocaine dental cartridge. You will kill the patient because of the adrenaline in it. You cannot use that. So you can use it as a slow infusion. I usually give it as a small bolus, um, one to two milligrams, but you can use five to 20 milligrams slow infusion over 30 minutes. Um, and it acts centrally, but it has a peripheral use as well. And that's where we can use it in dentistry. But the patient has to have very close heart rate and blood pressure monitoring. And if you're using an opiate, which I use a lot as well, fentanyl we use with, um, in, in, in cases of sedation with, with midazolam or propofol, then um, using a bit of lignocaine um, reduces inflammation at the uh, cannulation site, sorry, pain at the inflammation site, but it acts centrally and very useful peripherally okay so this closed mouth block technique is obviously useful in patients who have trismus but it doesn't mean that the patient has to have that for you to only use it as i'm using it more and more um it's a high block um, but you have to be a little bit careful because you can injure some of the vessels in the pterygoid plexus um but the way so there's a gout gates block again it's they're kind of similar um and if we look at the um the use of this is very useful with articane, again, to anesthetize the inflamed pulpal tissue um, to get obviously the level of anesthesia that are required to treat the patient. Articane, I'm not gonna go through it in detail, but basically it has a lipophilic nature, and therefore it's, if you look at point three, it's able to penetrate through the neural sheath and membrane uh, much higher as compared to other conventional local anesthetics, and that's why it's used so successfully uh, in, 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 our, in dental practice. Um, so the duration of action I was talking about, if you look at, just want you to look at the bupivacaine, because most of us use articane, lignic, lidocaine, prilocaine, um, and mupivacaine, again, some practitioners are using. But the bupivacaine is a duration of three to seven hours, very useful in long surgical cases. Um, it's not probably advised just to use it in general practice because you again it's hard to get hold of you have to use it plain but usually doesn't have adrenaline in it um, and obviously the post-operative problems with that is if the patient is numb for seven hours there's a high risk of them having uh, burn trauma from food liquids but also the incidence of post-operative dry socket alveolar osteitis is much higher because you've got a reduced 
somewhat an element of reduced blood flow to the healing socket. And those first, as we know, the first is a couple of hours are very essential in allowing that blood clot to form and stabilize. The key thing is the stabilization of the blood clot. Um, so we don't really want to have that type of anal anesthesia for that duration of time, but it is useful um, um, in, in long surgical procedures. And even if you've got, at the moment, if you've got a patient in pain and you can't treat them, uh, you can do a non-aerosol um, treatment, which is giving them local anesthetic. And if they're going to get seven hours to allow them to have a bit of sleep, then, you know, I, I think it's not a problem in that personally. So this is bupivacaine. Again, it's uh, 0.25% solution. Uh, hard to get off, but you can find it in um, uh, on Henry Schein. It's not to plug anyone, but that's the... Uh, one of the places we get it for, for, but just be careful of the, the, the duration is great in pain, but it has its pros and cons. Okay, um, sorry, I just like to put a couple of jokes in making this light. Marcaine is bupivacaine, that's the trade name. Again, very useful in uh, some cases where uh, if you've given the block with lignocaine, it's not working, you can uh, use um, bupivacaine quite successfully intraligamentary, again, intrapopoly are very useful as well. Now blocks, so the infraorbital block for the anterior maxilla is very useful. Obviously it's a very high block because the, you can see where the glove is on the left-hand side, it's 10 millimeters below the orbit rim. That's where the nerve um, uh, foramen is. So it's, 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 it's quite a high block, but it has a very good success rate, especially in patients where you, um, if you see a patient with a canine, for example, that it's, it's pulpitic and they've got a fat face and it, you know, it can be quite distressing to the patient because the swelling can be quite marked and you can get partial eye closure. So it looks, it looks scary if you haven't seen it for you as a clinician, obviously for the patient. Um, and sometimes you just can't get them, get them numb. So a high block in this case um, is quite useful for those anterior maxillary teeth. Um, the gout gates, again, it's very similar to the echinose. I'm not going to talk too much about the gout gates, but this is all stuff you can get uh, online. Um, and it's it, it sort of the needle endpoint is the lateral aspect of the anterior portion of the condyle. So if you look at the picture on the top right, um, it kind of shows you um, where to go. But what I want to talk about more is this, what they call the Vazirani. I've, I've, I've more heard of it called echinose. So if you see the patient's mouth is almost closed. Um, you can see the teeth in occlusion. Um, and again, useful in patients who need analges, anesthesia, even if you're unable to treat, but if they've got trismus from swelling, um, it's kind of what they call a flat anesthesia. So it's in line with the plane of the teeth and it's very, very high. And that's why it's called a high block, um, but it's very, very, very useful. Um, and again, this, these pictures show you Patient's mouth is basically closed. And if you imagine the plane of the, where the, the most posterior tooth is the upper eight or if then they've got a seven, and you're kind of literally going parallel and you put the whole needle in quite a long way. Um, and then you basically blocking the, the nerve um, from the top. And a lot of times when I see patients in hospital who've had failed anesthesia and have had, you know, the dentist has tried to continue the procedure and the patients, then develop this phobia, um, we want to hit them with everything because we don't want them obviously to, to face that, that trauma again, even if they're sedated or not, it's irrespective because sedation does not, um, is not an answer to failed anesthesia. You still need to give, provide um, sufficient anesthesia for the treatment to be, to be conducted basically. There are some um, little devices you can use. Um, they use these a lot in the States. There's one called the Vibrojet. It's basically it aims to vibrate the mucosa. Um, it's very, very useful, but obviously these things cost money. Um, and if you don't have one of these, it's a very simple technique. Shake the mucosa quite substantially before you give in the local and you'll find that not only provides the same aspect of what this is providing, but it's a great distraction technique because by the time you don't like shaking, the patient's thinking, what the heck is this guy doing? You've given the local anesthesia. Um, so it's a very, very good distraction technique um, for all our patients, but especially in those who have some sort of, especially needle phobia and, uh, you know, you're unable to provide sedation, especially in an acute case. Moving on to analgesia, obviously non-opioid analgesics, what we use routinely, um, 
ibuprofen, um, and then moving on to opioid analgesics, which some patients love because obviously it has an opioid effect. Um, but you can; these are all things that we can. Uh, they're non-opioids. They can obviously over the counter. Um, opioid analgesics you have to prescribe, um, and all the dosages uh, available in the BNF, which is obviously a, a, a great tool for us. So I'm not going to go into too much detail with that, but. I think what we need to be aware as dentists is that we can prescribe anything in the BNF. So obviously in the DPF, that's, that's, you know, we don't need to mention that, but anything in the BNF you can prescribe, you just have to be able to justify it. So for example, if you start prescribing morphine patches, amazing for the patient, but do we have the relevant training to do it? Probably not. And stay within your remit. Now, a lot of dentists don't know about the use of sodium diclofenac. And the problem with neurogenic pain, I find, is that sometimes you need to hit it with everything. So you can use the ibuprofen, you can use the paracetamol, you can use all that. And sometimes it works, you can use the codeines, and sometimes it doesn't work. And some, sometimes the patient needs a little bit more, especially sometimes postoperatively if they've had surgery, wisdom tooth, difficult extraction, implant surgery, whatever that is. Sodium diclofenac, 50 milligrams, 75 milligrams, TD, two days is really works really well in these cases I find really useful so it's something that I will talk about so there's an analgesic ladder if you look at the bottom it sort of goes on the anticipated pain level from mild to severe and gives you an indication of how much ibuprofen or paracetamol um, uh, or even hydrocodone can be used so you know a lot of times we're advising patients between 200 to 400 milligrams Sometimes it doesn't touch it. That's why a lot of times in acute dental settings, I remember when I worked at King's, we used to uh, routinely, when the patients were in the waiting room, they were given, obviously, after, after medical assessment, not the dental assessment, but they were routinely given effervescent 600 milligrams. And I talk about that here. 600 milligrams effervescent ibuprofen. It works very, very, very fast. We have to remember that with fast pass metabolism, with the bioavailability of the drug, um, a lot of it is going to be wasted. So we need to give a higher dose to get a higher peak to be sufficient for that, to give that patient um, sufficient, sufficient analgesia. So using something effervescent, even effervescent paracetamol, 500 milligrams, one gram, works much faster as opposed to the tablet because the tablet has to be broken down. You lose a lot of it, whereas this um, is a fast way of getting a nice dose into the patient. I'm gonna go backwards again. Oops. Yeah, okay. So we talked about the analgesic ladder. You can look that up. Um, now in a hot pub, this is something taught by an amazing dentist that I know. Um, he just gave us a lecture. So I've stolen this from him because he advised me this once with a patient I had, we just couldn't touch this tooth. Um, and um, this was back in the day when I didn't do any sedation, but night nurse, it's amazing. It's an over-the-counter medication. Um, it does make the patient sleepy, so you need to be aware of that because it has an antihistamine in it. Um, but it also has other ingredients like a bit of ethanol, so you need to check whether if you're advising a patient to use this, maybe for religious reasons, um, there's not going to be a debate here about this, but they may not wish to have that, that's fine. And obviously you need to confirm that the patient hasn't had paracetamol because it has a thousand milligrams of paracetamol. So if they're unable Sorry, if they're in pain and they haven't taken paracetamol and they're in the, especially in this COVID time where you can't see physically treat the patient, this is brilliant, especially to help them to sleep. But it can be used in the day, but obviously you need to warn them about the antihistamine and the potential drowsiness. So they shouldn't be able to drive um, um, and obviously looking after kids and the whole shebang. But it's very, very useful in the hot pulp because say we need to hit it with everything. So we need to hit it centrally, we need to hit it peripherally, and we hit, need to hit it locally. And this is a very, very good technique that I would advise all dentists to be aware of and utilize at this time with these hot pulps where we cannot do these aerosol, proceeding, or aerosol um, procedures. Now, obviously we can use, um, there are more complex drugs that can be prescribed, um, tramadol, um, Bupenafine is a good one as well, but you have to be careful of withdrawal symptoms. And again, obviously, if you are able to put an intravenous line in, 
and you have the relevant training, you can even give them the patient some fentanyl. Small dosage, um, I'll probably advise between 20 micrograms to 50 micrograms as a loading bolus, just to, to calm them centrally. Um, and then you can give even uh, your local blocks um, in this current time where you can't treat the patient, very, very useful. But I use, use a lot of fentanyl in, in, in sedating, sedating patients as well. But again, as I say, you can prescribe anything, just make sure you've got the relevant training to do it because the patients can benefit from a lot of these techniques. Um, we're not just solely stuck with paracetamol and ibuprofen. There's a lot of things that we can utilize to benefit them. We've talked about this inflammatory pain and the ibuprofen are very good, but again, 45 minutes an hour before, at the moment it's fine because you know we're not seeing huge numbers of patients, but even in when you go back to normal practice, you're seeing 20, 30 patients, you know, especially if you're doing emergency treatments, it's a great one to use because that will kick in centrally before you start giving your local uh, anesthesia. For acute soft tissue lesions in patients, even with ANUG, viral stuff that's going around, acute hepatic problems, gingival somatitis, very, very painful, and these are self limiting problems, but you may even want to prescribe some um, Diflam mouthwash. Um, that's sort of the trade name. It's benzodiamine hydrochloride, very useful, numbs, numbs soft tissues, but something over the counter, which a lot of patients use themselves, but is quite useful is benzocaine or a gel. So even in someone with an acute pulpitic sy uh, symptoms, now this is not gonna touch the pulp. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that. It's not gonna infiltrate through the soft tissue, through the mandible or through the maxilla, but Coming with palpitic pain comes soft tissue pain. So the more you can hit and reduce the pain, why not? It's amazing for the patient. So they can use this oral gel. Again, they can even use it on um, um, soft tissue lesions like ulcers, acute ulceration. Um, but this is an over-the-counter. They can buy it again. So it's something, it's something we need to be aware of um, in this time if we're not using it. Um, this is just a quick one I've stuck in, but it's not really relevant to be honest for day-to-day -day practice. But if anyone who's providing facial aesthetics, all this Botox and all that, there's an amazing um, um, formulation. It's called the BLT formulation. Benzocaine, lidocaine, and tetracaine. Um, a lot of it you use in the States, but this tetracaine is phenomenal. And if you use this on a patient and the patient feels anything, my advice is stop doing facial aesthetics because the patient should not feel anything. You can use Amitop, which is tetracaine on itself, but this BLT formulation is amazing for soft tissue, um, extra old soft tissue um, um, treatments. Very, very useful, but I'm not going to go into that too deeply. Antibiotics, I'm not going to talk about why antibiotics you can give, <clears throat> but antibiotics are given to deplete the pathogenic bacteria and infection. But obviously, most of them, like amoxicillin, are broad spectrum, and therefore they indiscriminately kill commensal microbes, which are useful in the gut. Back in the gut. So these are these bacteria are known as, are known as gut microbiota. And when we give, given things like metronidazole, always warn the patient that they may feel runny stomach. It doesn't mean they're allergic to it. Let them know. But you can do certain things. So you can, give you can give prebiotics, I'm not talking about antibiotics. You can give prebiotics and probiotics. Um, so prebiotics is before the patient's taken the antibiotic and obviously probiotics is while they're taking it. Very, very useful. And it prevents them having these symptoms. So, you know, there's loads of studies out there um, to talk about probiotics. They, 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 are very, they help um, with the live healthy bacteria in the, in the in the stomach, in the gut. And again, I think it's one thing that we don't do as dentists. We tell them to take these antibiotics, cause a lot of patients a lot of gut problems, especially metronidazole, which we use a lot. Um, so I think it's important to know a little bit. I'm not gonna go into details. We can talk about these at a later stage if we need to, but using prebiotics and probiotics are very, very useful in, in, in when we're advising patients, or sorry, when we're prescribing patients um, antibiotics. Again, fermented foods, the, our, Korean friends are amazing at this because they eat something called kimchi and it's been found to be very, very, very good for the gut microbiota. Um, again, so you can even advise, advise patients who are, take, are taking the antibiotics that we're prescribing them to have things like this, fermented foods. There's loads of different stuff on the market out there, but these sort of natural ones are very, very useful and you find the patients 
symptoms of the diarrhea and the bloating and all that significantly can be reduced by using these probiotics. Very, very useful. Um, few little tips with antibiotics. Don't forget you can give loading doses. So in patients with large facial swellings, you don't have to give them only the maximum dose that we might think 500 milligrams of um, um, penicillin, amoxicillin with metronidazole. We can give them a loading dose, for example, three grams amoxicillin if they've got a large facial swelling. Um, and again, augmentin is very useful. Augmentin has been recent, well, when I say recently, a couple of years now um, in the in the BNF, and not a lot of dentists use it, but it's very, very powerful in these large um, acute uh, dental swellings. It has amoxicillin, so obviously we need to take the relevant allergy, check the relevant allergies. And we have something in it called chlorvanic acid, um, which basically, if you just take from this, it lies the bacterial cell wall, basically allowing the penicillin to penetrate and then works very well. So um, if you're prescribing this, um, it's basically 500 milligrams plus 125, so it's 625 milligrams uh, every eight hours. Very, very useful. Even in patients that you may have seen, you may prescribe them amoxicillin and the swelling's getting worse. The patient at the moment doesn't want to go to hospital, is scared of COVID. You don't want their swelling to get worse. Use Augmentin, very, very useful, but obviously please be careful. It has penicillin, so we need to take the relevant questions for uh, allergy. Obviously, if they were to end up in hospital, then they would be giving it um, as a bolus is um, intravenous infusions, but that's just to be aware that the dosage is about 1.25 grams, using a lot in maxillofacial surgery. Now, oral sedatives, very useful at this time, useful in TMJ problems, muscular issues, Obviously, have to be careful in terms of dependency, and obviously they're going to be drowsy. But as a general dental practitioner, there's this whole debate: why do we have to have specialist training? Because the GPs dish this stuff out like sweets. Now, I'm not saying we should dish this, this stuff out like sweets, but in patients who have acute TMJ problems, you know, and they can't open their mouth, they can't eat, they may have a dislocated condyle, give them some diazepam. Very useful small dose, even five milligrams. You know, you can use a liquid solution. These are all from the BNF, so you can look this up. Small dose nightly for three nights. It will allow them for those muscles to be able to relax. Let them have a better night's sleep. And then, you know, then we're technically treating the pain as well because the pain's gonna reduce. So you can even use temazepam, some much stronger between 10 to 20 milligrams. Um, obviously, if you're gonna prescribe these things, obviously be ensure that you check in the patient's comorbidities and cross-reference that with the, 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 the BNF to make sure there's no um, issues in terms of interactions uh, and all the rest of the issues that we, we look at when we prescribe anything. But very, very useful for patients. Um, and we can use this stuff uh, currently um, for patients in acute, with acute problems as well. Um, looking at non-dental facial pain, maxillary sinusitis, again, the reason I've I want to talk about this is because a lot of patients who present with oral facial pain, they may come to see you as a dentist, the whole of the arch is in pain, you do all your diagnostic tests, tests every tooth is hurting. And you know, there are a couple of key questions we can ask and the key ones um, I sort of ask is, I'm just gonna flick through these. Doo -doo -doo. Yeah, so we're looking at, if, you know, they've got um, any pressure felt between tenderness behind the eyes and a, a key one I've, we find is when the patient bends because of the fluid level in the maxillary antrum um, is increased, this, this movement of the fluid level. So they might say, I get pain when I lie down, pain when I sit up, pain when I bend. That's a classic symptom of um, an acute sinus problem. And they would generally be presenting feeling run down, having nasal congestion. So we've got obviously, as Asim said at the beginning, make our correct diagnosis, but obviously this is not odontogenic in origin. So we then need to, treat the, the, the sinusitis. And we can use uh, nasal decongestants. Again, this is all in the BNF, um, so you can look that up. We can prescribe ephedrine nasal drops, very useful. But something I wanted to touch on, which patients can use this time at home, over the counter again, I wanna stress this, is decongestion. So saline nasal spray, um, very, very useful in uh, the sinus um, uh, patients presenting with acute sinusitis. Um, and if they don't have, they can't go to the um, to the chemist, the supermarket, like, to buy this if it's run out for whatever reason. They can make their own homemade saline. It's very easy. It's basically distilled water with salt in it, and they can use that as a flush 
to irrigate using, again, they can use the steam, the eucalyptus, or very, very powerful home remedies that patients can use without the need necessarily of having um, of, um, um, prescribed medications. So you can advise your patients to, to make their own saline solution. Um, this is just an OPG of the sinus on the right-hand side, much more opaque. It's a classic one we see when we're making a diagnosis with the patient, if we're not sure if it's not going to be any um, right, Moving on to sedatives, nitrous oxide. Um, it's an inhalation anesthetic used in high doses, produces general anesthesia, but we use it a lot in, um, so a lot of patients that I might see in general practice who are not overtly nervous of the dentist, but they've had maybe a traumatic time or they've had a, 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 a acute pulpitis and they've obviously the anxiety levels which I talked about at the beginning affect local anesthesia then we can give low dose nitrous oxide um, between 30 to sort of between sort of 20 to 40 45 um, the percentage of nitrous oxide oxygen very very useful in these in, in these in these cases right homemade remedies Let's have a look. So Arnica, very, very useful. I was taught this by a maxillofacial surgeon when I was at dental school. He used to actually inject articane into the TMJ as a first line treatment with patients with acute, sorry, with chronic TMJ pain dysfunction syndrome. Um, but we can advise patients to use Arnica cream. Very useful. They can rub it over the temporal and the joint externally. And Arnica is basically from, um, like a dandelion type flower extracted from uh, Arnica Montana and it has very good useful anti-inflammatory um, properties. Um, for denture ulceration or stomatitis, propolis. Propolis is basically waxy resin that bees produce to seal and protect the beehive. Um, it has very high antifungal antibacterial properties but use, I want to actually when I come off the slides in a moment, I'm just gonna hold up a couple of things in my hand and show you physically and what this stuff looks like. But it can be used very uh, usefully in these, again, these patients, patients can buy this stuff um, from relevant um, retailers and farm, some pharmacists, uh, pharmacists hold this. Uh, very, very useful in acute ulceration. I'm gonna show you a couple of cases, okay? Uh, let's not go into too much detail. So there's a book written by a, a gentleman I know, a very amazing guy who's involved in propolis globally. But for example, in dry socket case, patient can't, get, can't, back, can't come back to you for whatever reason. You can even advise the patient to use a liquid tincture of propolis. So it's basically liquefied propolis. Uh, you can get them to use, to flush the area out if there's any debris with saline rinse, hot salt water, and they can use a cottonwood bud um, yeah, but um, they can dip it in the solution and apply it to the um, to the actual socket. Very, very useful. They will get immediate relief of pain, just like when we use um, uh, uh, alva gel. Very, very powerful. But obviously, this helps with the natural healing of the site as well. There's a whole dental range. I'm not going to go into detail. We can talk about this another time. So this is an example of a case. On the right-hand side, you can see this large ulcer. Very, very painful to the patient. Um, and they've self, you know, you can, they, they, um, even though the dentist has applied this, they can self apply this at home. There's nothing wrong. Just got to check for allergy, make sure they're not allergic to bees or pollen or any of the constituents from the beehive. But the reason why this is so powerful is because it's sealed. You can see it's created the seal over this. So they get immediate pain relief. You don't even need to take Alan's user after this. How powerful it is. Again, this is pericronitis. The patient's in a lot of pain. Obviously, there's a little bit of swelling in there. But again, they've applied it to the area. It has antibacterial antifungal um, properties. So we're assisting the patient holistically, as I was talking about, we're looking at the whole system, not just uh, this is acting locally, but it's acting, acting systemically as well. Again, check for they've got no allergy. Now I'd advise everyone for themselves as well, start taking this, if you're not, 3000 milligrams of propolis daily. Very, very, very good for uh, immunity building. But all patients I see now, every single patient that comes to see me now, and I, they look run down, they feel run down, they've got acute sinusitis, they've got parotid, whatever it is, there's something systemic going. We need to treat it systemically, but let's treat it holistically. Let's treat it naturally. This, we use too much medications. Let's look at these alternatives that are going to boost our patients naturally, and they will thank you for it because they've come to you for one thing, but you've potentially helped them with actually 
sorting out the, the cause of their symptoms, not just symptomatic relief and treatment. Um, TMJ, I've talked about it already. Arnica, you can get, look this up online. Very, very useful. It's even used in osteoarthritis. Um, the gels are very, very powerful in these acute TMJ pain problems that you may be triaging online. Um, again, good for bleeding and bruising as well, but very useful to apply directly over the TMJ externally. Now, I'm not going to go into the detail, but when I talk at the end about the team, we as dentists, we need to work with others. We need to work with experts in the relevant field, musculoskeletal problem. A lot of TMJ problem, TMJ pain comes from musculoskeletal problems. So work with an osteopath. We're not experts in everything. Work with an osteopath. There's loads of papers out there of how osteopaths are treating these patients with their osteopathic problems, and then the TMJ problems are uh, are being um, you know being being treated. And you know they have they have protocols now for them specifically treating. And this is um, Khalil Hussein, who's an osteopath, and you know he's written a nice paper in Dentistry. Again, not this is was a bit written mainly about us as a dentist facing problem because of the way our posture is but this can be used very successfully again so liaising with other practitioners in this holistic care for our patients arnica i've already talked about it analgesic anti-inflammatory skin conditions the different places you can get it from um the more natural the better um immunity boosting as i said you can advise patients to use this nigella sativa the black seed oil so we're advising patients to use propolis. We are advising to use this Nigella sativa. Amazing research out there on how powerful this stuff is. Antioxidants, anti-inflammatory, immunity building. Um, I won't go into detail. It's 9.45, a better round up. So the future of the dental team. You've got the dentist. We need to be obviously liaising with the GMPs, the general medical practitioner, nutritionists, psychologists can deal with, help us to deal with the phobia, osteopath with these mus musculoskeletal issues. And I'm writing a... Um, post-operative um, um so post post-op xla sheet at the moment which i'm hopefully going to include all these stuff different remedies even using the vitamin c the dosage vitamin d for healing all these different things that we can use to give our patients full holistic care um in summary reconsider that what your diagnosis if you think it's odontogenic or not pre-op analgesia one hour before helps in these hot cases Oral sedative, diazepam is an example. The high echinose block, very useful. Um, psychological needs assessment, immunity boosting. Watch this space, thank you.